This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson. This week, procrastination may be deeper than you think. Find out what you're really avoiding. Procrastination really is an emotion-focused coping strategy. It's not a time management problem. It's an emotion management problem. The psychology of procrastination when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Reed Pence, the producer and host of Radio Health Journal. If you like listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. We educate workers around knowing their rights. And it's interesting to see their reactions when they know that whatever the case may be, that they actually have rights in this country. The fight for labor rights. Them. Don't tie allowance to chores. It's good to give kids chores, but research has shown that it's important to give them that responsibility so they feel like they're doing their chores as being part of the family, a team player, and not just getting money for it. The importance of instilling money lessons early on. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Radio Health Journal and Viewpoints on your favorite radio station. And subscribe and listen anytime on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. We've all done it. We've all put off sending an important email or doing laundry until the bin's overflowing. Procrastination is common. But what is it exactly? Delay is part of our lives. But there's other forms of delay that aren't purposeful or planful and don't benefit us. But in fact, they are self-defeating forms of delay. And the biggest one is procrastination. And we define it in psychology as the voluntary delay of an intended act despite expecting we're going to be worse off for that delay. And that's really important to put all those together because some people like to say that procrastination has an upside or define concepts like active procrastination. And we'd say, no, from all the research we've seen over the last few decades, procrastination is always related to negative things. That's Tim Pitchell, Associate Professor of Psychology at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario. He spent more than 25 years researching procrastination and says that it goes much deeper than simply putting off a task. Procrastination really is an emotion-focused coping strategy. It's not a time management problem. It's an emotion management problem. So I'm facing a task that I find aversive somehow. And aversive can mean uh, I'm bored or I'm frustrated or I resent what I have to do or I'm feeling anxiety or I'm uncertain. You pick your favorite negative emotion. So you have this negative emotion associated with a task. And in order to get rid of that negative emotion, you realize, gee, if I just get rid of the task, there goes the emotion. And so in the short term, procrastination is very highly reinforcing. It's a negative reinforcer. We get rid of a negative stimulus, in this case, some negative emotions. But of course, the problem with it is that the task doesn't typically go away. And then we build up more stress and problems like that. So it is all about emotion regulation. And once we realize that, we're well on the way to dealing with it. There's one underlying emotion in particular that's usually the driving force of procrastination, according to Christine Lee, a clinical psychologist and procrastination coach in New York City. The big evil issue, I think, is fear. And I think that might come as no surprise to you or your listeners. Fear can be really a very personal foe where we can be afraid of something that is a no-brainer and not daunting to someone else, but we can have our own private fears and layers of fears, fears of uncertainty, fears of judgment from other people, fears of failure, sometimes fears of success. And sometimes we're afraid of just the next thing that is on the horizon. And therefore, we tend to side with our fear and our procrastination and stay still. For example, many of us have made plans to hit the gym now that they're open again. And then, over time, we just don't go. Why does that happen? What is it about procrastination that makes us lose sight of our goals? You get to that point in the day when you're supposed to exercise and, "Ah, I don't feel like it, I don't want to. So you make this noble intention for tomorrow. And your immediate reaction, you feel pretty good about that now. I didn't feel like exercising, I'm not exercising, but I still have my intention for tomorrow. 
ironically, but predictably, what we predict we're going to feel tomorrow is based on how we feel today. This is the work of Gilbert at Harvard University about affective forecasting, predicting how we're going to feel tomorrow. So right now I'm procrastinating on my exercise, but I still think I'm going to feel like exercising tomorrow because I feel pretty good now. And tomorrow comes and of course I don't feel like exercising any more than that. Now putting it off again, I'm starting to see this pattern in my own behavior and we start that downward spiral. And so stress starts to build as well. So that awareness of one's procrastination affects one's self-concept, self-confidence, self-efficacy, and we start going down that rabbit hole. This downward spiral can happen to anyone, but it's more common for people with a heightened sensitivity to negative emotions. For them, it can turn into chronic procrastination. My own definition of chronic procrastination is when the procrastination itself becomes the bigger problem. We start procrastinating because we just want a little break or we feel that the paper or project are just too daunting for us to deal with in the present moment. But when we start making it a longer term habit and we start relying on it as the go-to behavior and it starts causing secondary consequences, like we start having to lie or to make ourselves look not so accomplished in the workplace or when we have to start making excuses for our behavior or lack of behavior, then I feel you're looking at a chronic condition where the person doesn't really know how to escape the pattern or the habit. And then they're looking worse and worse to other people and to themselves as well. So the self-esteem also takes a hit when people start to use procrastination chronically. Lee used to be a procrastinator herself. She says that from her own experience, being a chronic procrastinator is something like never going to bed peacefully because you know you have things to do, but you can't quite do them. It's exhausting and can create even more emotional burdens. Guilt is just like the procrastination thermometer. So if you're starting to feel guilt, that is the awareness that you're not doing what you said you were going to do and you feel some culpability for it. But if you are a procrastinator, you aren't doomed to a downward spiral forever. Lee has developed her own system to help her take tasks head on. There's the SMAC technique that they can remember. Simplicity, mindfulness, anxiety reduction, communication, and kindness to self can get you there. And you don't have to do all at once. You can just start with one area, and I think you'll be feeling better shortly. And to combat his procrastination, Pitchell focuses on mindfulness. I gently move my attention over to the next action. And when my focus is on action, I'm no longer focused on emotions and I don't need to try to cope with them. And of course, what happens then is there's an upward spiral. In contrast to the downward spiral we talked about, now I have this upward spiral that social psychologists have demonstrated that when we make a little progress on a goal, it fuels our motivation and our well-being. Pitchell says it's important to forgive yourself for procrastinating then you can move forward with compassion. We all have daunting tasks in our everyday routines and we're all capable of facing them. Our studio producer is Jason Dickey. I'm Nancy Benson. Radio Health Journal returns in just a moment. Cardiovascular or CV disease is the number one killer of adults in the U.S. And millions of people trying to reduce their risk of a heart attack or stroke may unknowingly be taking medications that are not proven nor FDA approved to reduce cardiovascular risk. Let's hear from cardiologist Dr. John Osborne. Many people are unaware that after a failed outcome study, the FDA revoked the approval of phenofibrates when added to statins as the risk outweighed the benefits to heart health. It's important to remember that statins, along with diet and exercise, can lower cardiovascular risk by about 25 to 35 percent. But persistent cardiovascular risk, which can lead to a life-threatening event, may remain. I would tell anyone still being prescribed phenofibrates, such as Tricor and Trilipics, with a statin to talk to their doctor about FDA-approved therapies for cardiovascular risk reduction. To learn more and get clear on the facts, visit itscleartomenow.com. Again. That's it's clear to me now.com. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Radio Health Journal is a production of Media Tracks Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. 
Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. When you turn right to do your daily chores or errands, whatever it is, you avoid that. You avoid sitting and waiting. You avoid the carbon expenditure. If you add it all up, how much money is the country or the world wasting when they're sitting in traffic idling? The safety risk and wasted time of turning left at busy intersections. Then a new way of thinking about dementia. Suppose you had dementia, because I think it's a pretty likely outcome for a lot of us. What would happiness in that circumstance look like? All that and more on Radio Health Journal.